Um, find rest for your souls. Let me say that again. The theme for today is come. Find rest for your souls. Jesus tells us in Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Who here is tired? Who here is anxious? Who here has problems? Check, check, check. <laughs> God wants to give you some rest. And I don't know about you, but that verse sounds really sweet. Let's start off with some prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to spend time with you and learn about this verse because I got a huge blessing from, from learning about resting and what this means. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you help everyone here to find rest for their souls and to just be filled with your, your peace and your love and your Holy Spirit by the time the service is over today. We ask for the reigning of your Holy Spirit on this church and on each and every person here. Come, be with me. Anoint my tongue, anoint my mind. Give me rest. Give everyone rest here. In Jesus' name we pray. We ask and we thank you. Amen. You know, the direct translation from Greek to English sounds even sweeter, if you can believe that. It says, come to me, all those toiling and being burdened, and I will give rest to you. Are you toiling with something? Does it seem like you're surrounded by burdens or is someone burdening you? You probably have people in your life that make it a lot harder than it needs to be, right? Well, I have great news for you. God wants to give you some rest. And today, We'll be talking about how to find rest for our souls. But before we start, I just want to, I want to let you know we're going to do something different and you may have to get out of your comfort zone just a little bit. But what I want from this is for you to feel fellowship with your church family. Is that okay? Can we lift each other up in Jesus? Can I get an amen for that one? Amen. amen. Well, for us to do that, we're going to take some time to listen to each other, okay? And this is what we're going to do for today. First, we'll read Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30 from the New International Version altogether. Then each of us will pray quietly about that. Next, you'll share with someone what you think Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30 means. Then... I'm going to break down those verses for you. And finally, I'll have a song of meditation and conclude with a closing prayer. Does that sound good? Okay. Uh, let's open up our Bibles to Matthew 11, 20 to 30. They're in the, in the pews right in front of you, page 1,352. Or you can use your Bible apps. Make sure it's the New International Version. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30, page 13, 52. It's not up there, but we can read it together. If you have it, say amen. 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 Okay. <laughs> now let's read it very slowly together, because I want you to ponder and meditate on it. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, 
and my burden is light. Ponder those verses, okay? I would like everyone, those of you who are watching online, you too, everyone, <laughs> close your eyes and just sit quietly. When I say begin, speak to God for two minutes about what we just read. And when I say it's time, quiet your mind and allow God to speak to you. I'm going to do it too. Ready? Close your eyes. It's your turn to talk. Ready? Begin.
does Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30 mean to you now? You're going to take two minutes each to share with the person next to you, but please don't go over the two minutes. Figure out who's older and allow that person to go first. Those of you who are online, I want you to share the two minutes with God again, and when the two minutes is over, just sit quietly and allow God to speak to you again one-on-one. Are you ready? Find your person. Now figure out who's older. Look at the person next to you and share what Matthew 11, 28 to 30 means to you. Time starts now. Older person, begin. person, it's your turn now. Begin.
watching you guys. I didn't want to put you on the spot, so I didn't want to stare, but you know, it's, it's beautiful to see you guys fellowshipping together. Do you feel like you fellowship today? Do you think you know you think you know the person next to you a little bit better? Just a little bit? You feel closer to them? That's what church is about. It's just a little bit hard to be in harmony with people you don't really know. So to work together in harmony, we need to talk to each other, share the Bible together. If you don't know someone's heart, you can't learn to love them. In music, listen carefully. There's a piano, lots of fingers, two hands are working together. There's a synthesizer in the background. True harmony is only obtained when all the instruments are in tune with each other. That's God's will for us here, to be in tune with each other. So we're going to turn the music down, and we're going to move on to 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 to 15. Paul the Apostle, he tells the Corinthian church, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? Paul was not trying to be mean or non-inclusive. He just knew something that they didn't realize, and the combining of God's truth with the idolatry was going to be a problem. They would lose their harmony together. They wouldn't be in tune with each other. Sometimes we get so focused and we get so preoccupied with our burdens that we overlook the fact that Christ has offered to take our burdens from us through his yoke. If we take his yoke and put it on, he promises that he'll lighten our burdens and make us equally yoked with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And if we're all doing the same thing, we can, be, we can be in tune with each other. As we learn from Christ, he begins to erase the devil's lies in our mind. And as we allow him to transform us, we become of one mind because we're choosing to learn from the same source, which is Jesus. Instead of listening to the devil and his lies that keep you in darkness. The longer that we're blindfolded, the longer that blindfold stays on your eyes, the harder it'll be to regain your sight. I remember um, learning about people who lear- worked in caves a long time ago and they had to be exposed to the light for, um, they had to get out of the cave in order to not become blind. And if I put it another way, the longer you allow a foothold to become a stronghold, if you keep allowing that foothold to, to stay and the, the devil to, to keep you down, the more difficult it'll be for God to move you because it just gets, you get so heavy, right? And you're, you're allowing, you're allowing that, um, that stronghold to keep you from giving God your burdens to be light. He wants to transform you because at this point, if your heart continues to um, not be pliable, pretty soon it turns to stone and it's hard for God to work with stone. He can do it, but it's, it becomes more difficult. And I found that in our one-on-one relationships, it's where we rejuvenate when we spend time with God in that one-on-one time, I like to bask in him. I enjoy going to that intimate place in the morning so that I can just cry out to God and just bask in his word like a lizard basking in the sun. It's what rejuvenates me, and it gives me what my soul needs for that day because we all know every day has its new challenges, correct? (laughs) But sometimes... We get focused on the destination, and we're not making enough time to enjoy the ride, right? Those are the Marthas. 
those are the Marthas in, in, in ministry. It, it can look like this. I'm so busy with my ministry or life in general. I don't have time to be spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically nourished, but I'll be fine. I just need to keep doing God's work. Well, guess what? God wants you to be your best holistically. He wants you to have homeostasis. And you can only find that if you nourish yourself holistically. And I'm preaching to myself, by the way. Then there's those that are all over the place. They may feel nourished, nourished mentally and physically, but spiritually, life's too busy for God. Or they may just want to have fun. They forget they have an actual destination. They end up getting lost at sea and sometimes never finding their way back. It may look something like this. I just want to enjoy life. I know God has rules, but he died on the cross for my sins, right? And I'm a good person. Deep in my heart, I guess I know he designed me to need him to get to heaven, but it's scary. Following his rules might keep me from being successful or from living my life to the fullest. Or worst case scenario, I can face rejection or self-realization. Yikes. If you really think about it, or if I really think about it, I feel lost and I don't have complete peace, but I'm just not sure how to get it. Finally, you have the people who get it. They're enjoying the ride. They know exactly where they're going because they take time to pray. They gain their wisdom from the source. They quietly listen for God and to what he says about, well, everything in their life. If possible, they will take spiritual breaks throughout the day, especially before they start their day because that's what Jesus did. And that's where they gain their power. So with each day, they follow Christ's example and they feel rejuvenated. And as a result, God gives them that peace that surpasses all understanding that the Bible promises to those who give him all their burdens. It may look something like this. Daddy God, no matter what I'm going through, I just seem to have this peace that surpasses all understanding because I've been spending time with you and I'm getting to know you better every day and I'm realizing I can trust you. Your word is true. You give me your power to shine. You give me your wisdom to do the right thing. Thank you for doing that today. Did you identify with any of these? It's just something to think about. I would like us to, stu to study Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30 together. And um, you, can, uh, you can look up at the PowerPoint for the literal Greek to English translation. And in case anybody was wondering, I'm not trying to be an intellectual. I just think that learning the original language of the Bible or the New Testament, which is Greek, helps us to have a much richer understanding. But I'll only be reading the English part today. You can refer to the slide for the original language. Jesus the Christ says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, all those toiling and being burdened, and I will give rest to you. And just a heads up, I'm going to be reading a lot from my favorite Christian author, Ellen White, because she explains these verses so clearly and with such richness that I would not do it justice in paraphrasing or summarizing. In chapter 34 of the book, Desire of Ages, in the chapter called The Invitation, Ellen White says, These words of comfort were spoken to the multitude that followed Jesus. The Savior had said that only through himself could men receive a knowledge of God. He had spoken of his disciples as the one to whom a knowledge of heavenly things had been given. But he left none to feel themselves shut out from his care and love. All who labor and are heavy laden may come to him. Scribes and rabbis, with their punctilious attention to religious forms, had a sense of what that rites of penance could never satisfy, had a sense of want that rites of penance could never satisfy. 
Publicans and sinners might pretend to be content with the sensual and earthly, but in their hearts were distrust and fear. Jesus looked upon the distressed and heartburdened, those whose hopes were blighted and who with earthly joys were seeking to quiet the longing of the soul, and he, he invited all to find rest in him. In Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus says, Take the yoke of me upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle in the heart, and you will find rest for the souls of you. So let's break this down. Jesus Christ has a gentle and a humble heart, right? And if you take his yoke and learn from him, you'll find rest for your souls. Just a note on the gentle and humble heart, let's not judge books by their covers, okay? Have you ever met someone who seemed mean or conceited or whatever, and when you got to know them personally, you found a beautiful heart? Okay? So then you have the sheep that inside, the Bible talks about the sheep that are ravenous wolves on the inside. And the rest, well, what you see is what you get, okay? But only God... Only God truly knows and understands our hearts 100%. In the same chapter, Ellen White comments on Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, saying, Tender, Tenderly he bade the toiling people, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. In these words, Christ is speaking to every human being, whether they know it or not, all are weary and heavy laden, all are weighed down with burdens that only Christ can remove. The heaviest burden that we bear is the burden of sin. If we were left to bear this burden, it would crush us. But the sinless one has taken our place. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us, of us all, Isaiah 53, 6. He has borne the burden of our guilt. He will take the load from our weary shoulders. He will give us rest. The burden of care and sorrow also he will bear. He invites us to cast all our care upon him, for he carries us upon his heart. The elder brother of our race is by the eternal throne. He looks upon every soul who is turning his face toward him as the Savior. He knows by experience what are the weaknesses of humanity, what are our wants, and where lies the strength of our temptations. For he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He is watching over you, trembling child of God. Mm. Mm. Are you tempted? He will deliver. Are you weak? He will strengthen. Are you ignorant? He will enlighten. And my favorite one, are you wounded? <laughs> yes, he will heal. The Lord telleth the number of the stars, and yet he healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wombs. Psalm 174, verses 4 and 3. Come unto me is his invitation. Whatever your anxieties and trials, spread out your case before the Lord. Your spirit will be braced for endurance. The way will be opened for you to disentangle yourself from embarrassment and difficulty. The weaker and more helpless you know yourself to be, the stronger will you become in his strength. Mm. The heavier your burdens, the more blessed the rest in casting them upon the burden bearer. The rest that Christ offers depends upon conditions, but these conditions are plainly specified. They are those with which all can comply. He tells us just how his rest is to be found. Next slide. Matthew 11.30, Jesus says, The yoke of me is easy, and the burden of me light is. Ho, ho. In other words, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Isn't that sweet? Amen. Continuing on chapter 34 of Desire of Ages, Ellen White says, Take my yoke upon you, Jesus says. The yoke is an instrument of service. 
Cattle are yoked for labor, and the yoke is essential that they may labor effectually. So let's pause. The yoke and the labor need each other in order to be effective. By this illustration, Christ teaches us that we are called to service as long as life shall last. We are to take upon his yoke that we may be co-workers with him. The yoke that binds to service is the law of God. The great law of love revealed in Eden, proclaimed upon Sinai, and in the new covenant written in the heart is that which binds the human worker to the will of God. If we were left to follow our own inclinations, to, to go just where our will would lead us, we should fall into Satan's ranks and become possessors of his attributes. Let's take another pause. Basically, Jesus has given us a hedge of protection, which is the Ten Commandments and service for God. This hedge protects us against what the enemy of our souls would use to distract us through our burdens with the intent to have us lose focus on Christ. So to counteract that, Christ is telling you, give it all to me. Stay with me and enjoy the rest and the peace that I'm providing to you. And when we realize that, you want, you want to know something? The enemy of souls has nothing. Did you hear me? He has nothing. Satan is disarmed as we rest in Jesus. Amen. Can I get another amen? amen. Jesus. Let's continue. Therefore, God confines us to his will, which is high and noble and elevating. He desires that we shall patiently and wisely, wisely take up the duties of service, the yoke of service Christ himself has borne in humanity. He said, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Psalm 40, verse 8. I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. John 6, verse 38. Love for God, zeal for his glory, which is God's character, by the way, and love for fallen humanity brought Jesus to earth to suffer and to die. This was the controlling power of his life. This principle he bids us adopt. There are many whose hearts are aching under a load of care because they seek, they seek to reach the world's standard. They have chosen its service, accepted its perplexities, adopted its customs. Thus, their character is marred and their life made a weariness. In order to gratify ambition and worldly desires, they wound the conscience and bring upon themselves an additional burden of remorse. The continual worry is wearing out the life forces. Our Lord desires them to lay aside this yoke of bondage. He invites, he invites them to accept his yoke. He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He bids them, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And his promise is that all things needful to them for this life shall be added. Worry is blind and cannot discern the future. But Jesus sees the end from the beginning. And every difficulty he has he has his way prepared to bring relief. Our Heavenly Father has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. Those who accept the one principle of making the service in honor of God supreme will find perplexities vanish and a plain path before their feet. Learn of me, says Jesus, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest. We are to enter the school of Christ, to learn from him meekness and lowliness. Redemption is that process by which the soul is trained for heaven. This training means a knowledge of Christ. It means emancipation from ideas, habits, and practices that have been gained in the school of the prince of darkness. The soul must be delivered from all that is opposed to loyalty to God. In the heart of Christ, were reigned perfect harmony with God. 
there was perfect peace. He was never elated by applause, nor dejected by censure or disappointment. Amid the greatest opposition and the most cruel treatment, he was still of good courage. I need to learn that. <laughs> but many who profess to be his followers have an anxious, troubled heart because they are afraid to trust themselves with God. They do not make a complete surrender to him, for they shrink from the consequences that such a, a surrender may involve. Unless they do make the surrender, they cannot find peace. It is the love of self that brings unrest. When we are born from above, the same mind will be in us that was in Jesus, the mind that led him to humble himself that we might be saved. Then we shall not be seeking the highest place. We shall desire to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn of him. It reminds me of Mary uh, when Jesus says, come sit at my, you know, he says, Mar Martha, stop working. Come sit at my feet. Mary's chosen, she's made the right choice. You do that too. Anyway, we shall understand that the value of our work does not consist in making a show and noise in the world and in being active and zealous in our own strength. The value of our work is in proportion to the impartation of the Holy Spirit. Is it us? No. Is the Holy Spirit. We can do nothing. Trust in God brings holier qualities of mind so that in patience we may possess our souls. The yoke, now this is, this is really cool. She says, the yoke is placed upon the oxen to aid them in drawing the load to lighten the burden. So with the yoke of Christ, when our will is swallowed up in the will of God and we use his gifts that he gives us to bless others, we shall find life's burden light. Isn't that amazing? He who walks in the way of God's commandments is walking in company with Christ and his love, the heart is at rest. Oh, sorry. He who walks in the way of God's commandments is walking in company with Christ and in his love, the heart is at rest. Forgot that little in his love. That's very important. When Moses prayed, show me now thy way that I may know thee, the Lord answer him, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And through the prophets the message was given, thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way? That's a straight and narrow path, guys, by the way. And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. Exodus 33, verses 13 and 14, Jeremiah 6, verse 16. And he says, Oh, that thou hadst hearkened to my commandments. Then had thy peace been as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. Isaiah 48, verse 18. Those who take Christ at his word and surrender their souls to his keeping, their lives to his ordering, will find peace and quietude. Nothing of the world can make them sad when Jesus makes them glad by his presence. In perfect acquiescence, there is perfect rest. The Lord says, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Isaiah 26, verse 3. Our lives may seem a tangle, but as we commit ourselves to the wise master worker, he will bring out the pattern of life and character that will be to his own glory. And that character, which expresses the glory, the character of Christ, will be received into the paradise of God. A, reno a renovated race shall walk with him in white, for they are worthy. Mm. As through Jesus we enter into rest, heaven begins here. We respond to his invitation, come, learn of me. And thus, and in thus coming, we begin the life eternal. 
Heaven is a ceaseless approaching to God through Christ. The longer we are in the heaven of bliss, I like that word bliss, the more and still more of glory will be open to us. And the more we know of God, the more intense will be our happiness. What? What? Yes. I want it, Jesus. As we walk with Jesus in this life, we may be filled with his love, satisfied with his presence. All that human nature can bear, we may receive here. But what is this compared with the hereafter? There are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more. Those homeless people, no more hungering. Oh, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Revelation 7 verses 15 to, 7, 15 to 17. Right? Do you want your father, do you want daddy God to carry your burdens and wipe away your tears? Oh, I do. Do you want rest for your soul? Oh. God basically says, it'll be much easier if you just let me take care of you. I want you to look at the slide up there. Okay? And imagine that Jesus is saying it to you because he is. And when I say beloved, I want you to put your name in there. You can close your eyes or keep them open however you want to do it. Come to me, beloved. You're toiling and being burdened. I want to give you some rest, beloved. Learn from me, beloved, and you will find rest for your soul. I want you to think about God's call in your life to rest in him and to give him your burdens. Do you yearn for his rest. Amen. Do you want his yoke? Yep. You're under a yoke anyway, by the way. It's either a yoke of sin and burdens or it's God's yoke. And his yoke is light and easy. Now close your eyes. And allow God to speak to you as I sing the final song.